Hello, welcome to Guide London. My name is Nick Salmon. I'm a blue badge guide for London, one of 600 members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides, the organisation behind the Guide London website. If you've been joining us over the last few weeks, you'll know that on a Monday, a Wednesday and a Friday, we do some live broadcasts trying to bring a little bit of London to you wherever you are in the world during this lockdown period. So far we've covered history, things like the Great Fire of London, we've covered culture, some of our great galleries, and we've covered some of the way Londoners live their lives. Now today we're going to be talking about a book. It's this book here, The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel, the final in the trilogy of books that talk about Thomas Cromwell, one of Henry VIII's most important ministers. Uh, the book came out in March and immediately went to the top of the best-selling list, selling more than 95,000 copies in the first three days of its issue. Now, the book is a sequel to these two books, Wolf Hall and Bringing Up the Bodies. Wolf Hall published in 2009 and Bring Up the Bodies followed in 2012. Both those first two books were made into a television, television miniseries in 2015, and they mainly dealt with the events leading up to the execution of Henry VIII's second wife, Queen Anne Boleyn. Queen Anne Boleyn was executed on the 19th of May, 1536. That's 484 years ago tomorrow. Uh, the final book takes the story on to the end of Thomas Cromwell's life. Now, to talk about the three books, I'm joined by three Blue Badge guides. The first one is Jeff Metzger. Uh, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been guiding. Hi, Nick. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm a relative newbie in this profession, actually. I've been guiding for four years. Um, and um, I, I guess you could say uh, history is my passion. I used to um, run the History Channel here in Europe. And um, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, someone who just loves the past and uh, loves telling people about it. Excellent. We're also joined by Karen Sharp. Karen, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been guiding. Well, I've been guiding for 21 years, believe it or not. This is my second career. And my interest really lies in legal London. But I love history. I love the stories. Um, and I'm also interested in guiding in the art galleries, so the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery. Excellent. So the final guest who's joining us today is Howard Medwell. Um, Howard, tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been guiding. I've been guiding 14 years, and uh, for part of that time, I had the privilege of uh, giving history lectures to training me that guide. And in the course of particularly this, I became more and more obsessed with history, and it's getting worse as I get older. <laughs> and I speak of someone who experienced the teaching from the other end. Howard was our tutor when I did the Blue Badge Guide a couple of years ago, and uh, he certainly knows his historical facts. <laughs> So we are broadcasting live. So if you've got any questions, do put them in the comments, either on Facebook or YouTube. We will try and answer them if we possibly can. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Jeff, who's going to start off our discussion of the book. Jeff. Thanks, Nick. And um, hello to everyone. Um, I guess we should start by saying that Tudor history has had a bit of a renaissance in recent years, uh, thanks in part to Hilary Mantel, but also thanks to popular television series like um, The Tudors. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. Uh, certainly uh, authors like Philippa Gregory with books like The Other Boleyn Girl and um, and um, some of you may know the Shard Lake series by C.J. Sampson. Uh, as Nick said, the Mirror and the Light covers a remarkable period of just four years from uh, 1536 to 1540, uh, beginning with the execution of Henry's second wife, uh, Anne Boleyn. Um, that sets off a, a kind of a a struggle between two uh, forces, really, the forces of reform and the, for and the forces of kind of a more conservative approach to uh, the English Re Re Reformation in the country. And it's also, this in this four years, Harry, uh, Henry also ma managed to uh, marry his uh, third, uh, fourth, and fifth wives. And I should also say, um, um, there's a spoiler alert here, he also executed Thomas Pro uh, Cromwell. I hope I'm not giving um, uh, too much away there. And um, accepting his own execution, Cromwell's signature was all over most of these events. He was an immensely uh, competent, uh, canny, uh, devious uh, uh, lawyer and, and wheeler dealer. Uh, he was the go-to guy for Henry for anything that he wanted uh, to get done. 
uh, and he got a lot done. Um, he, uh, it, it was his legislation that created the Church of England uh, then made Henry its supreme head. Um, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries was very much under his guidance. And um, he was also the man that got the first officially sanctioned uh, Bible published in English uh, in this country. Henry and Cromwell are at the center of this book, but there is also a vast cast of characters at Henry's court. And we'll talk about some of these people, particularly the women. Um, uh, we'll also talk about the English Reformation and its particular character. Um, and um, we'll also talk about Mantell's extraordinary ability to bring her character to life. We'll also have a bit of time uh, for your questions and comments, so please do message us. So uh, without further uh, ado, um, I guess I should start with you, Karen. What did you think of the book? Uh, well, Jeff, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a weighty tome. It's quite large, <laughs> difficult to read in bed, but um, very much, as we've all discussed, a page turner. And I like the way that she immerses us into the history. You think of that period, the Tudor period, it's almost like a soap opera with all the characters and the stories that are going on. And that's why I think many people enjoy it and especially enjoy reading Mantell's books itself. It must require a huge amount of research to get all that detail in that actually brings you in and immerses you into that time. So although you know the ending, it's still a bit of a shock when it happens. So yeah, I did enjoy it very much. Great. How about you, Howard? Well, yeah, I was uh, blown away by it. Uh, she's uh, Hilary Mantel set herself a, a, a very difficult task. Because she's got the main character is also the all-knowing, omniscient uh, author. Uh, he he really does. He's the kind of guy who knows whatever's going on. He knows things are happening before they happen, and uh, he's kind of the centre of the book. Uh, it is, in a way, surprising that, 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 that Karen said it, it's a real page turner when you think it's so heavily researched everything is kind of likely there there's nothing really that stretches the imagination regarding history and yet you really do want to find out what happened next even though you basically know what's going to happen next or have a pretty good idea about it uh another thing i really liked about the book is these strange pauses when suddenly uh, she's not telling you about history she's telling you about the scent of lavender from the women's linen or or, or the behavior of a cat or a dog or the stars shining through the window, which uh, of course they don't do anymore in London, but in those days apparently they did. Um, that sort of thing is is really part of the magic of the book. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, one of the things which um, always brings a novel, shall we say, to life is knowing the places in which um, in which it takes place, uh, and um, and that was certainly true for me with this book. In fact, uh, Mantell herself in the afterward of the book um, actually um, gives a special nod to the importance of places, actually. She says that uh, a welcoming place into your imagination, um, even if it's a location surrounded today by a modern architecture, was very much key to um, her um, kind of getting access to the material, so to speak. Did knowing any of these sort of existing, existent locations, uh, as well as both of you uh, do, make the book become, make it even more, uh, make it even more vivid for you? Howard, why don't you start? Well, the place that really clicks for me uh, is uh, the, the magnificent palace of Hampton Court, Hampton Court Palace. Obviously, ideally, you would go there by water, not by train or car, because that's the way Henry VIII went there and Thomas Cromwell went there. Uh, Hampton Court is not specifically featured so much in, in, in um, The Mirror and the Light, but there's part of Hampton Court which really brings you into the two worlds of Thomas Cromwell. Henry VIII's Great Hall, uh, the place where actually the king didn't eat, but where many magnificent occasions took place. Many of the ambassadors who are important characters in the novel uh, had to do with Henry in, uh, in the Great Hall of Hampton Court. You walk past magnificent and extremely expensive tapestries, which feature also um, as part of the literally the scenery of the book. But then Downstairs from the Great Hall are the extensive kitchens, and not just the main kitchen, but the fish room, the cheese room, the boiling room, the green court where the carters had to turn their carts around for an endless supply of, 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 of food and drink when the king was in residence. And of course, uh, Thomas Cromwell as a young boy, this, is, this was his introduction into the 
into the adult wor world and a pretty aggressive, foul mouth introduction it would, would have been. And there's a place called the, the, the serving area at the other end of the great kitchens where the staircase goes up to the great hall. And you imagine a culture clash between the serving people and the kitchen people. And when you read uh, The Mirror and the Light, as with all Hilary Mantel's, all three of Hilary Mantel's novels, she's not particularly scared of rude words. There's lots of aggressive swearing. And you can imagine the aggressive, angry, uh, stressed atmosphere between the overstressed kitchen staff rushing up and down these magnificent stairs. And uh, sorry, the, the serving staff running up and down the stairs and the kitchen staff running backwards and forwards in the kitchen. And the atmosphere is, is extremely extremely clear, easy to, 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 to internalize, to get hold of there. On the other side of London, there's another building, a more modest building, uh, called, 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 called um, Hutton House, which, uh, sorry, Sutton House, I was thinking of another uh, Tudor character, Sutton House, uh, which is from the outside, it looks mainly Georgian, but in its origin, and in the center of it, in many of the internal rooms, in many inside many of the rooms, it, it is Brick House, which was where uh, Rafe Sadler lived, who was a kind of protege of Thomas Cromwell, who married a, a, a young woman in Thomas Cromwell's household and lived in Brick House for many, many years. He survived much longer than most people did in the 16th century. He had lots of kids uh, and some fragments, uh, particularly uh, the brickwork and uh, quite famously, the linen fold um, uh, wooden panelling are still extant in Sutton House. And I would recommend certainly a visit there. It's in uh, the Homerton area of the London Borough of Hackney, very different area from Hampton Court, but it uh, brings back the atmosphere of the time very much. Okay, great. Karen, what about you? Have you, uh, have you got some favourite places? Yes, about an hour's uh, train ride from London, you will find Windsor Castle the oldest inhabited castle in Europe. It's the home of our queen, Elizabeth II, but it was one of Henry VIII's favorite homes. And we know that Cromwell would have visited. He was made a member of the Order of the Garter, uh, which is housed in St. George's Chapel, which you can see there. The building was completed in Henry's reign in 1528. And when you go inside, you can see the senior me the orders, member of the orders themselves with their banners, their crested helms, the helmets that you can see on top of the stalls, and they each have a plaque. And Mantel, it's lovely when you get towards the end of the book, tells how that Cromwell's enemies ripped the garter, the George, from his person when he was arrested. And if you can picture it, if you've been degraded, so he's, he's going to be executed, they're degraded knights, they would have ripped down the helm, they ripped down the banner, and they would have kicked it out of the chapel. And it eventually would have been kicked into the ditch at Windsor Castle. So that's quite a vivid, uh, what you will see. And of course, after his name in the ledger, he's actually shown as a traitor, va proditor. Fire on me, traitor, or oh, traitor. And everywhere his name appears, he's seen to be a traitor. So a wonderful place to visit. A little bit closer, uh, sorry, I should say, you've also got the tomb of Henry VIII, buried there, of course, with his favoured wife, Jane Seymour, who gave him that long-for son, the future Edward VI. But somewhere a little bit closer to home in London, on the east side of the city, is the Tower of London. Now, like Windsor, this is an old building. Um, the tower, the white tower that you're looking at there dates to the 11th century, built by William I of Normandy. We don't call him William the Conqueror in London. He didn't conquer us. But the tower is known as Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress at the Tower. So it's a royal palace to begin with. And one of the most famous uh, scenes at the tower, you have the gate, Traitor's Gate, as we call it today. Originally, this is a Watergate entrance for the king, Edward I, in the 13th century, to come and visit the tower and stay in his apartments, which are above. But in the 16th century, it gets that name, Traitor's Gate, where you're rowed in along the River Thames, 
you walk up the steps that you can see there. And of course, you're now within the tower. And it's somewhere that Cromwell knew very well. He would have, as the Lord Privy Seal, the Lord Chancellor, he was involved in questioning prisoners at the Tower of London. And of course, this is where he ends up himself in 1540. He is not executed within the tower. He's executed outside at Trinity Square Gardens. And this is what you're looking at, the scaffold site at Tower Hill. You can imagine all the people there coming to see him, this low baseball man who's made himself one of the, the most important people in the country at the time. The nobles didn't like him. The population didn't like him. He'd risen above his station. So they're there to see his execution. And luckily, although he's arrested for treason, he's not hung, drawn and quartered as a commoner maybe have, would have been. He is beheaded as a no member of the nobility would have been. So Henry was a little bit lenient. He gave him the chance to be beheaded, although with an ax, not a sword like Anne Boleyn. And he's buried with Anne Boleyn, amongst others, in the chapel that you can see, the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, again built in the reign, well, I should say rebuilt in the reign of Henry VIII. The previous chapel had burnt down. But Cromwell is one of a thousand people buried there. And it's said to be one of the saddest spots in Christendom by the 19th century historian, Thomas Babington Macaulay. And he said it's not one of the greats such as Westminster Abbey where people are buried, but those who have been buried there because of their enemies or cowardice of friends or the misery that they've fallen into. Um, so we don't know the exact burial of Cromwell, but his name is on a list with others that he would have known and, pro and had sent to their executions. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to ask you both, uh, because you know quite a bit about Henry's reign and about the Tudor period, um, if, if, this, um, if this book really changed your perspective on anything in particular. Um, Howard, well, well, how, why don't you go first? Well, it, it did actually develop my perspective um, on the question of Henry VIII in particular and absolute monarchy in general, because um, I'd always thought Henry VIII was simply um, a selfish, bullying pig more or less. Uh, that would be my considered judgment of him. And absolute monarchy was a system which enabled men particularly to be bullies and, 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 and do what they liked. Actually, this novel makes clear the constraints. Probably Henry was a bully and a bit of a pig with it. But the constraints on his position as absolute monarchy were also very, very strong. And this makes it very clear. And of course, Cromwell's The Art of Statesmanship or The Art of being a politician that Cromwell is so good at is based on kind of reading the situation, understanding the pressures on Henry and giving the king a bit of encouragement in one way and another. So for me, that was a, a moment, well, a, a bit of enlightenment that, 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 that the novel gave me, which you don't normally expect from a novel. Um, uh, you know, it made uh, Henry's life and Henry's behavior not necessarily uh, uh, nice, but it made it easier to understand. Okay, okay. And uh, Karen, what about you? Did, did this book change in any way your perspective on, 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 on that period? Not about Henry. I still don't like him. He's a tyrant uh, and a bully. Uh, and that is very much a propaganda portrait by Holbein. Whereas if you look at Holbein's portrait of Cromwell, Cromwell's very much, I always thought of him as Henry's creature who did everything that Henry wanted to. He's a, he's a bureaucrat. Um, but you get to have a, a much more in-depth look into Cromwell's life with the books. And I think Mantell makes him human. And he does appear very human in those books. And uh, one of the key tidbits that when you're reading that you find out is that he's responsible for births, deaths and marriages. You can imagine the common people hating the fact that they think he's going to tax them. But it's something we take very much for granted these days that they have to be registered. So, yeah, so it did change my perspective. Okay. Karen, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, actually, because we talked a little bit about this, was the women in the book. Um, I mean, it's filled with wonderful women characters, um, and many of them, shall we say, in a supporting role, so to speak. These were the, the women who uh, kind of very often, um, you know, attended the, one of the, the various uh, queens of Hen Henry VIII. Um, and, um, you know, it's, 
the way in which uh, women were, and this is one of the things that really kind of changed my perspective on things, was the way in which uh, women were considered, the way in which they were objectified in in every way possible, really. Um, but particularly um, in marriage, I found what um, what Mantel called, um, I think she said, uh, the cold transactional nature of Tudor marriages. Um, what do you think about uh, Mantel's work here? And, and could you talk maybe a little bit about some of some of the women characters in the book? Yes, certainly, Jeff. Uh, I mean, women are seen as basically there to bear children, as borne out by Henry's wish for an heir. So that's all they're intended for. Their families use them to make political marriages. What's it going to gain them? Is it going to gain them prestige, power, whatever they can get? But in the book, Mantel, she brings forward some very interesting women. Three of them I've picked out. The first one is Mary Howard. Uh, who would marry Henry's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Um, they marry when they're teenagers. And because of what had happened to Henry's older brother, Arthur, he refuses them to actually consummate the marriage. But he gives her a, what we would today call a book that she could use to write poetry. It's known as the Devonshire Manuscript. And if you can imagine that at Anne Boleyn's court, the idea is that the young men were basically write poetry and music, and the idea was to flirt. So you can see what's going on at um, Anne's court. And Mary becomes involved with that, as does um, another lady called Margaret Douglas, who is the king's niece. Now, she's a really interesting character. She falls in love with one of the Howards, um, the half-brother of the Duke of Norfolk, a man in the book who's called Tom True, and uh, they fall in love and they both end up in the Tower of London. But they're writing to each other, and this book has about 185 poems in it, and some of them are between Margaret Douglas and Thomas Howard, so they're writing to one another. And then, of course, today you may recognise Margaret uh, she ends up in the tower two more occasions at least in regard to her sons. One of them is Henry Darnley, who married Mary, Queen of Scots. She was released when he was murdered. And the other was her younger son, Charles, who married Elizabeth, uh, the daughter of Bess of Hardwick. So she sort of falls foul of most people, but she's a very strong character. And then the third woman you come across a little bit less so. Mary Shelton, she's another one of the Boleyn family, um, but she too is involved in writing some of this poetry some of, uh, in the manuscript that you'll find. She ends up having, we believe, an affair with Henry around about 1535 for six months. She doesn't get anything out of it, but it's probably at the instigation of her family. Um, because he's not happy with Anne Boleyn, who's a relative. So these women really come alive, um, and they're quite strong characters. Mary Fitzroy so much that she never marries, even though they try and push her to marry um, Tom Seymour, at least on three separate occasions. And then she'll later give evidence against her brother, and it ends up with his execution just before Henry's death, the Earl of Surrey. So I find these women very interesting. And of course, the Devonshire manuscript is available at the British Library. So you can look it up. Oh, wow. OK, um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, love was a, it was a dangerous thing, really. And uh, mm. it was actually um, very dangerous to kind of uh, sort of um, devalue the assets of a, uh, of a king. Actually, we saw that with uh, with his with his uh, his niece Meg. Actually, and Tom True actually Tom Truth actually loses his head, uh, not only for um, 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 that dalliance, but also uh, according to Mantel um, for his bad poetry. I guess um, I love that scene in the book where um, uh, Cromwell comes into the tower and actually um, you know uh, interrogates him on the quality of his poems. Actually, yeah, he's not very um, impressed. <laughs> Howard, no, not at all. <laughs> No, poetry could get you into trouble. There's no doubt about it. Mm. Howard, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, about Mantell's perspective on the, on the English Reformation, I got the sense uh, from this book that unlike um, uh, that which was happening in Northern Europe in, in the 16th century, uh, the English Reformation uh, was lacking in any kind of real moral compass, a, a kind of a faith that sort of flip-flopped uh, in its beliefs, uh, rather more that it was... Um, 
how can I say it, an instrument, in fact, of, uh, of political expediency and fluctuations at court, according to who had uh, Henry's ear. Um, in fact, I remember there's one moment in the book where um, uh, Jane Seymour has led, uh, is read the, um, the Last Rites, uh, even though uh, final anointing um, has been removed as a sacrament from um, uh, these, these 10 articles that uh, uh, Mantell alludes to, which define uh, the new religion. And uh, it, it just seemed like a quite a sort of a, a confusing lot to me. It was uh, certainly didn't certainly seem to be able to, uh, Henry didn't seem to be able to make up his mind about, uh, about this business. Would you say that um, uh, history bears Mantell out here? Yeah, I think that is broadly true. Um, you know, that England, unlike many neighbouring countries, didn't have religious wars. Um, plenty of killing went on, but there weren't religious wars. And Cromwell, although Cromwell seems to have had uh, a broad sympathy with reform, um, he was certainly not very keen on the more fanatical uh, Protestants, the Anabaptists and people like that. That was his own position. And I think uh, his actions were uh, motivated more by political, for political considerations uh, in real life as, as they are in the book, as far as one can tell. One thing that Cromwell definitely was in favour of historically and in this novel was that uh, the English people should have access to the gospel in their own language. And although he didn't do a great deal, uh, to try and save William Tyndale, who was uh, uh, the original translator of the Bible into English in this period, who was executed, burnt at the stake in what is now Belgium, what was then part of the empire, the German empire. Um, he did work very hard uh, to get Bibles into churches in England. And when you walk into an English parish church now and you see a big brass bird, which uh, is actually an eagle, but I believe clergymen refer to it as the duck on its wings. It's carrying the Bible in English. And that has been the case with a certain interruption uh, during the reign of Mary Tudor. Uh, that's been the case since Cromwell's time. And historically, Cromwell worked very hard to get the Bible uh, available in English. And this is certainly reflected in the novel. Okay. Um, there is one more thing I'd like to talk about before we, uh, we go to questions and comments. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about historical fiction. Uh, Mantell herself, in fact, in the afterword uh, of this book, calls her a novel, an historical novel. Um, and, but I think it, it kind of pushes the boundaries in a way that I've, I've never quite experienced an historical novel uh, in this way, uh, perhaps because her research was so exhaustive, perhaps because the events, the thoughts, the conversations, the motivations of the of the figures that she presents to us are often so uh, meticulously uh, tied to documented um, actuality. Um, she manages to make real people really real, if I if I can, if I can say that. Um, uh, people whose characters and conversations. Uh, are entirely plausible as explanations for the events um, w w which transpired. Did either of you feel that this book went, um, should we say, beyond the genre uh, in some way? Um, Howard, what did you think? Um, well, I think it's a very, very remarkable example of the genre, and she certainly pushes the genre. Um, the point that struck me was, if you go into history, especially history that's four or 500 years ago, you come to a point at which you're, you have to speculate. You simply do not know what people thought. You don't know much about what they said. You know a thing or two about what they did. Uh, you have to speculate, use your imagination, look at the evidence. And in a sense, the speculation of a novelist is only a few degrees more, I don't know, speculative than the speculation of a historian. And so the things that Cromwell says in this novel s seem very much like to me, at any rate, very much like the things he probably did say, with very little exception. One point about this, of course, I think, is Mantell's use of language. It must be difficult if you're a historical novelist. Do you have them all saying Trudy Syrah and Quaffa and that sort of stuff? Or do you have them talking like the kids uh, in my street? Uh, it's actually quite a, a difficult decision. Um, and one does notice that she selects very carefully language which might be contemporary, but which almost certainly had an equivalent at the time and language which is a little bit old fashioned, uh, but makes sense to us today in 2020. 
Um, an example of this is when, uh, just after the execution of Anne, Anne Boleyn, uh, Cromwell's son asks the constable of the tower, uh, Kingston, if a woman has ever been executed there before. And uh, the constable require, uh, uh, um, uh, replies, not as far as I know, not on my watch at any rate. Thoroughly modern phrase, which, which, which uh, a modern day politician might say, but it fits probably what someone like Kingston would have said had he been asked that question, you know. Uh, if I just go to the other side, two words are frequently used, uh, up and down. Uh, the word up means in revolt. They talk about the Lincolnshire rebels being up. Last year, the Lincolnshire was up. That meant everything to them. We don't know what that means, but we can guess what it means very quickly from the context. Or when someone else says, when Anne Boleyn came down, uh, that means when she had her head chopped off, you know, and, and her faction was totally defeated. And again, a, a, a 16th century use of language, which very quickly becomes very clear to the reader in 2020. Okay, thanks. Karen, did you find this, uh, shall we say, a, a, a book which pushed the genre? Yeah, I mean, I found for for me as a historical novel, it's it just totally immerses you, and you you forget that you're reading what is essentially a novel, and you, you're reading history. Um, and I, I'll be very brief because I know time is going on. I think when she's recently interviewed, she mentions that at the end that even now Cromwell eludes her. Well, I don't think so, but um, for me, she just brought him totally to life. I agree. Okay, um, I think we're going to draw our conclusion amongst ourselves to a close now, and um, and let's see if um, anybody is um, has got any 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 comments from um, from the field, from the peanut gallery, so to speak. I think all three of you. That was fabulous. Um, there's lots of comments coming in. Uh, Sarah Reynolds uh, says she hasn't read the book yet, but you've said you feel highly of it. She seems to think of it. Uh, Laura is uh, watching us from California, saying good morning from California. She's reading the book right now, so very interested in the presentation. Uh, Steve Fallon is actually looking at Sutton House from his office window. So he, he obviously is in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Hilary Mentel is at the virtual Hay Festival this year. I think you can get tickets online. You can actually see that online. You just um, choose your mm -hmm. festival on the Wales border, but this year it's all going to be online because of obvious reasons. Uh, Val says she's enjoyed all three books, so well written, and bring Tudor London to life. And Eddie says it's a great book, Making Cromwell a Hero is a tough ask. So do you think <laughs> Cromwell is a hero? Is he the hero of the book? What do you think, yeah. Well, um, it's hard to call him a hero, isn't he? He's certainly the protagonist. Um, I mean, he's, um, I, I find him entirely plausible and I thank Hilary Mantel for having uh, made him that for me, really. Um, much like um, what Karen said, I, I thought he was brought to life in a way that was absolutely extraordinary. Um, he was, as I said, a, a man who was just incredibly competent, really knew how to get things done. And uh, which, which place would you recommend if people coming to London, as we hope they will be soon, and they want to find a bit of real real Tudor London, where would you recommend someone goes to experience that? So Jeff, let's start with you. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the Tower of London gives you the willies. It really is a very, very genuine place. Um, and it's a, it's a place that, um, um, it's really all right there. You know, we saw a picture of Traitor's Gate. Um, that is the real gate. That's where they came through. That's where people like, Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell arrived and they really walked across those stones and um, um, you know they really were kept in the towers that are there and in fact we saw a picture of St. Peter ad Vincula there's a green in front of it and that's the green where Anne Boleyn lost her head so um, these are these are real actual factual palpable events which um, I think the tower really uh, you know really makes you feel yeah, there is something about standing at the place where it actually happened, isn't it? And uh, knowing you're just a few feet from the body of where, you know, Anne Boleyn lies. So it is, it is very evocative. What about you, Karen? Where would you recommend people go to? I would recommend Hampton Court Palace, Nick. Uh, a Tudor palace. Uh, you get an idea of this, the grandness of King Henry VIII's 
a little bit of his apartments with the great hall, the what we call the long gallery. But don't forget, it's Wolsey's building first. And of course, Cromwell worked for Wolsey. So he would have known Hampton Court quite well. And then, of course, where Mantell explains about all the different initials having to be changed. So you can imagine every time you go to Hampton Court, there's different initials and they've sort of missed a few from Anne Boleyn, especially in the eaves of the Great Hall. So for me, that is definitely a place that you should visit. And there was a question about Hampton Court, actually, which comes from Bodell. Is it true there's a ghost at Hampton Court? Catherine Howard, is that true? Yeah. It's yeah. alleged that there's a ghost. And some people say, yes, she's been seen running down the gallery because, of course, her household was disbanded there when she is found uh, to have committed adultery. So it is said her household is disbanded in the watching chamber. She's a prisoner. She manages to escape the Queen's apartments and runs down the gallery to try and get to Henry, who's at prayer in the chapel. And so that's why she's said to haunt the building still today. And that, of course, that comes after Cromwell's time. So he, he After 1542. So, yes, 1542. So he's gone by then. But, uh, but yeah, uh, Mantell alludes to it a little bit within the book. And, and we find that Cromwell says, don't say that, that it's sort of something you shouldn't talk about because someone mentions that she's no, known right. several people. So you have to be exactly. careful. And he won't delve into that one. What do you about Howard? Howard, what would you say is the one place that you recommend people to oh, play? The prime location, uh, weirdly, perhaps, is, is the river. I, I think the river is never absent from this book. It, it, you travel by water and the river is always there. The, river, uh, the, the, the smell of the river and the dampness of the river pervades a number of the scenes. So if you've got a, bit, a few hours to spend, uh, get on at Greenwich and make your way to Hampton Court. Uh, you won't see from the river that many buildings that go back to Thomas Cromwell's time. Um, but as Hilary herself says in, in her afterwards, you mustn't resent modernity. We're in modernity, but the currents of the river and the, ever, the presence of the river and life on the river, which of course still continues, are very much part of the scene throughout Cromwell's life and throughout all of Hilary Mantel's novels about him. It would be a great trip. How long would it take you to go all the way from Greenwich to Hampton Court? I'm about five hours. Five hours. You get yeah. some amazing views on the way. It's definitely worth doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm going to come back by train. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you, all three of you, for that really illuminating talk. I have to admit I haven't read the books, but I shall go off and uh, I shall start them now. Um, do come back and see us on Guide London as well. Come back on Wednesday. Wednesday we're going to be talking about William Shakespeare. Um, of course, our most famous playwright. And then on Friday, we've got our long-awaited um, talk about the Beatles, the Beatles in London, which um, Eddie Lerner is going to send to us. So we'll be able to see that on Friday. If you want to know any more about our guides or about Guide London, then go to the website, guidelondon.org.uk is the best place to find out more information. You can look up all the popular tours. Um, you can also find a guide. So if you want to search for any of our guides, all you have to do is type in the name, click on the search button and that will bring you up on their, their profile. So thank you for Karen, thank you for Jeff, thank you for Howard for today. Uh, do you. share this with your friends. We want as many people to see it and we want you to come and visit us in London when the lockdown is lifted, which hopefully won't be too long now, fingers crossed. From all four of us though for the moment, goodbye. Goodbye, thanks. <laughs>